Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the John W. Fisher II Lecture in Law and Medicine at the West Virginia University College of Law. This lecture series is made possible through the generosity of Dr. Thomas S. Clark and his wife, Jean Clark. Established in 1998, the Law and Medicine Lecture is one of 10 across the university in various disciplines created by the Clarks. As you can see, the Clarks are amazingly loyal mountaineers. Dr. Clark earned his medical degree at WVU in 1975 and became the medical director of Mylan Pharmaceuticals and the CEO and owner of Clinical Pharmacologic Research Incorporated. His wife, Jean, completed her BA at WVU in 1967 and then earned a master's degree in education in 1974. She has served the university loyally in many capacities, most recently on the foundation board of directors. The Clarks have two sons, Stuart of Nashville and Chad in Morgantown, and the entire Clark family chose to honor their friend, John W. Fisher II, with this lecture. They did it when he became the 15th dean of the College of Law in 1998. John is also a loyal mountaineer, earning his BA and JD at WVU and serving the university over many years in many capacities. The West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals refers to him in his professorial status as the state's foremost authority in the field of property law. He became the first William J. Mayer Jr. Dean in 2007 and now serves as the William J. Mayer Jr. Dean Emeritus and my wonderful friend and mentor. Dean Fisher is married to Susan Fisher. They have a daughter, Jennifer, a son, Jay, and two very loved grandchildren, Austin and Emily. On behalf of the College of Law community, our thanks go out to the Clarks for their generosity and for their recognition of the importance and the beneficial connections between law and medicine. Thank you so much, Dr. Clark, for giving us this opportunity to bring the two disciplines together at least once a year. Today... Today's speaker repre represents the best of these beneficial connections between law and medicine. Ellen Lawton joined the Medical Legal Partnership Movement <clears throat> in 2001 and in 2006 developed the National Center, where she is now the executive director. It is at Boston Medical Center and the Boston University School of Medicine. She is a graduate of Northeastern Law School and a, was a fellow at the Harvard Law School as a Wasserstein Fellow. She has devoted her career to coupling law with medicine to serve those in need. I want to tell you very briefly about what medical legal partnerships are so that you understand more about the scope of her work. They are the 1993 brainchild of Dr. Barry Zuckerman, a pediatrician at Boston Medical Center. He recognized that some debilitating and very expensive illnesses persist, notwithstanding the smart, compassionate work of doctors, and they persist due to the crushing disadvantages of socioeconomic circumstance. Dr. Zuckerman partnered with an attorney to address the legal needs of his patients that stood in the way of their good health. The idea really became a movement, and there are now over 200 such partnerships around the country. Our medical legal partnership with the WVU Pediatrics is just one of the 200. Today, our speaker in her topic, Addressing Medical and Legal Disparities Through Medical Legal Partnerships, will help us understand how legal interventions in the healthcare setting can improve health for low-income populations and transform the healthcare and legal system. Please join me in welcoming Director Lawton. Good afternoon. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Dean McConnell, and thank you to the Clarks for bridging the uh, disciplines the way that you do through these le this lecture series. And thank you to uh, my wonderful hosts for inviting me to be here, uh, Dean McConnell, Val, Val Vidic, uh, Steve Paul, uh, Suzanne Weiss, 
Um, I also want to um, thank uh, the MLP uh, folks in Charleston who uh, were part, I know, of the, some of the momentum here, and that's Kate White uh, and the team at the Legal Aid uh, Office uh, of West Virginia, as well as the uh, health care providers at Family Care Health Centers uh, in uh, Charleston. So um, there's really a groundswell here in West Virginia, and I can feel it. Uh, in terms of uh, medical legal partnership. I like to tell people that um, sometimes I, I feel like the goodwill ambassador for the legal profession in uh, talking to healthcare providers uh, because the news that I bring to them is actually the missing link in the healthcare uh, work that you're doing is that you don't have a lawyer on your staff. And that may uh, sound um, uh, not make sense to some health care providers, but I think we're really gaining ground uh, nationally, as uh, Dean McConnell referenced. So uh, my job today, I think, is to uh, just unpack for you a little bit about the background of medical legal partnership, uh, sort of walk you through uh, our perspective sort of on the theory of medical legal partnership and uh, share with you some of the successes and then uh, hear your questions and, and talk about uh, what the opportunities are for this model, particularly in a uh, state like this, in a community like this, with such incredible um, uh, passionate commitment to uh, promoting the well-being of the communities that, uh, that you're part of. Um, so I'm going to start with hopefully getting this right, which is, here we go the notion that um, patients need more than health care. And so when we think about uh, uh, vulnerable communities uh, going to see the doctor, uh, kids who are going to get checkups, uh, knowing that this burden that's represented here in the cartoon um, that parents carry uh, is very present in the health care setting uh, for physicians, for nurses, for social workers, and, and uh, most assuredly for kids. And so how can we uh, think about these uh, issues of rent and heat and school and food and access to income? And what we know in the legal community is that many of uh, what, what you saw depicted in that cartoon, those are legal needs. Uh, so access to safe housing, access to certain kinds of income, access to health care, uh, those are legal needs, and uh, I'm looking over here. Oh, I can see it here, too. Sorry. Um, those are legal needs, and they are connected to health needs. And so we can think about, um, as you can see in this chart, all of these legal needs, we use a, an acronym called IHELP. It helps the health care providers to remember what we're talking about when we talk about legal needs. And you can see the list here, the food stamps and shelter access and utility access. All of these, uh, what we call the social determinants of health, uh, all impact uh, family health and child health. And so how can we understand uh, how legal interventions can improve uh, access to some of these benefits, improve uh, the ways in which families experience some of these legal needs, and hopefully promote health for, um, for vulnerable kids. Another way of thinking about the prevalence of legal needs, and this is, again, something that we think about in the legal community, uh, whether we're pro bono attorneys, legal aid attorneys, law school professors, uh, legal aid clinics, law school clinics, we think about the legal needs of uh, individuals and families. Um, but it's not something that's really on the radar of health care providers. They um, don't have a concept of what a legal need is. Uh, they think about legal needs as being uh, something that is uh, uh, directly court-related, when oftentimes legal needs, as we know as attorneys, uh, are a matter of offering advice to someone, right? And so there's all kinds of ways in which we as lawyers need to help uh, health care providers understand the context of legal needs, the prevalence of legal needs, and uh, what those resources are to help families. Another way of thinking about the uh, resources that exist in the legal community to help vulnerable families is to look at this chart that comes from the Legal Services Corporation. You can see 
uh, that private lawyers, there's uh, one private attorney for every 429 people in the country. I feel okay about that as a lawyer, and I hope you do too. I think uh, being a lawyer is a really important uh, role in a community, but then you look at uh, the ratio of legal aid attorneys to people in poverty, and you can quickly see that the resources are going to outstrip the demand. And so how can we think about how to um, address these legal needs that result in poor health, and what are the strategies and innovations we can come up with to try to do that? <coughs> this is a, a case that came from one of our sites, a uh, single mom of two diagnosed with stage two breast cancer needing multiple health care visits for her diagnosis and staging. You can see uh, one of the uh, health care impacts there. She gets a lumpectomy and she starts her radiation. She misses a lot of work and she loses her job. What you see on the side is ways in which the early intervention and prevention might have uh, helped Claudia avoid losing her job might have helped her to assert some rights that would protect her income, um, thereby protecting her family. As you see it play out, after losing a job, she has no income, and then she and her children are faced with eviction. Now that might be normally where a legal aid office comes into play uh, when the eviction is happening, but you can see that there were stages earlier that legal intervention would have been helpful in maintaining her um, health and well-being. And then you can see there uh, are numerous places in uh, the safety net for vulnerable families, uh, such as Claudia's, uh, where a denial of health coverage happens. Maybe it's an administrative error, uh, but it's uh, an issue that uh, legal advice and intervention may have addressed and therefore uh, assisted her in maintaining her health. So what we've developed to try to improve access to early preventive intervention to legal um, services is the medical legal partnership model. And as Dean McConnell laid out, this was really came out of the brainchild of a pediatrician who was frustrated in seeing some of the impacts on his patients of lack of access to legal expertise. Um, MLP is a healthcare delivery model, integrating legal assistance as part of the patient care, a vital component of patient care for vulnerable populations. So we're going to talk a little bit about what that means and what the impacts are. Core components of the model, uh, there are three of them. Legal assistance, you can see that's a, a piece of the pie. We call this the pizza pie. Uh, it's a piece of the pie, but it's not the entire um, activity of a medical legal partnership, right? You have a legal team on site in the healthcare setting who's helping to provide legal services for vulnerable uh, patients and families. The middle component, I think, is really the critical component, and that's why I'm so excited to see what's happening here in West Virginia in particular um, with um, the engagement of the law school in helping to think differently about how do we provide legal services beyond uh, direct legal assistance, one client, one lawyer, one law student. If you look at health and legal systems, institu health and legal institutions and practice transformation, so that's a mouthful. What does that really mean? It means, uh, as I was saying earlier, that uh, Health care providers don't really know that a lot of the pro problems that families present with, the reason that they couldn't comply with their oncology treatment, the reason that they were unable to make their follow-up visit, is actually a problem that has legal dimensions and legal solutions. And once they realize that, then they, and they realize that lawyers are really important partners for health care providers in serving vulnerable populations, then the opportunity becomes to integrate legal uh, strategies, legal thinking, and legal team members as part of the healthcare team. And hopefully, 
change some of those clinical systems so that you reach many more patients than you can in the one client, one attorney at a time. So an example of that is um, working with clinics where uh, you, access to utility service is a challenge for families. And so you have a child who's got asthma, who has a nebulizer, which is a machine that helps you breathe if you have asthma. But that machine is not going to do you much good if you can't plug it in and if you don't have utility access. So you may end up in the emergency room again. So maybe the most important legal intervention that we can do for you is to make sure that you have consistent utility service in your home so that you don't come back to our emergency room for costly health care. The last piece is policy change. And I know I don't have to convince you as a room full of lawyers, budding lawyers, and friends of lawyers that policy change can be really the uh, one of the most important goals that we pursue as a community uh, to improve the policies that impact our most vulnerable uh, individuals, families, and communities. And so what we find is that medical legal partnership enlists health care members in your community, physicians, nurse practitioners, health care administrators, hospital CEOs, in the mission that we care about as lawyers, which is to serve vulnerable populations. And so um, identifying a problem in a policy that impacts uh, kids who need health insurance, kids who have uh, a disability and need a ramp to get into their home, uh, helping to address some of those policies more systemically with meaningful participation from all the community members who care about this family, from the lawyers to the health care providers to other community advocates. Um, and we, what we see happening in the medical legal partnership model is that it really does bring uh, those uh, folks to the table. So building on a community partnerships, uh, it's almost an exhaustive list of potential um, stakeholders in this model because you can see that if you can save some money on care because you've avoided an emergency room visit for a child with asthma, well, health insurers might actually be interested in that. They might be interested in helping kids to stay out of the emergency room. And you can see that um, certainly the private sector pro bono community um, is uh, very engaged in the notion that the medical legal partnership can bring them in even closer to the children and families that they might want to serve. Um, obviously, law schools, bar associations, uh, the American Medical Association, any number of uh, entities that touch on law and medicine are engaged in various facets of this model. This is my 101 for the uh, lawyers and budding lawyers in the room. Our job in medical legal partnership is to really understand the health care setting that, um, that your compatriots in the medical profession are practicing in. Um, and so we talk about it as uh, being cultural brokers between the two professions, right? And so understanding, uh, helping healthcare providers not only to understand what legal needs are, but helping them to understand who, what is a pro bono attorney? What kind of services do they offer? What is a law school clinic capable of? Letting them really understand what the legal resources are in a community and also what the deficiencies of those resources are. And for our side, as lawyers, we need to understand how hospitals, health centers, um, and other uh, health care institutions, who those stakeholders are, how they organize themselves, where the power centers are, so that we can really engage our resources with theirs in a meaningful and strategic way. So what I found is that even though uh, there are some wonderful advocates in the healthcare world, uh, sorry, in the legal world, who do, do amazing uh, um, chain of command advocacy. They can sometimes get pale in the face of a complex hospital bureaucracy. Um, and so understanding uh, how those hospitals operate 
and, um, and how to be effective in a hospital setting, I think, is a really critical component of being successful. Our impact, I've talked a little bit about that, and that's certainly what uh, we are looking to sites like uh, WVU to help us to delineate. What is the impact? You know, I've talked a little bit about improved health and well-being. I've talked about improved medical home uh, and institutions. We can talk a little bit more about that, and I'll walk you through. Uh, but really, our ultimate goal is improved policies, laws, and regulation that accrue to improved uh, health and well-being. So when we talk about improved health and well-being, what do we mean? As I mentioned, a fewer emergency room visits, decreased stress, right? We know for uh, virtually anyone the notion that stress is going to impact your health. I'm feeling a little bit right now. Um, it, but decreased stress is certainly going to have an impact on your health. And so what we hear from our healthcare providers is, I can't talk to my patient about improving access to, about improving physical activity if they're worried about being evicted. I can't talk to my um, patient about different preventive interventions when they have a crisis on their hands that can only be solved with legal intervention. So if we can help with some of those issues, then we're going to see improved uh, coping. Less severe chronic disease. And anyone who reads the newspapers knows that in our country, the prevalence of chronic disease is creeping up. And so we need to be thinking creatively about how to address chronic disease. Uh, improved medical homes and institutions. That's, again, healthcare lingo for you. And it's our job as lawyers uh, operating in a healthcare setting to try and understand what that really means. Better compliance, right? It means did you show up for your appointment? Or did you uh, not show up for your health care appointment because you had to go to court because you were being evicted, right? Um, is there uh, a cost-effective effect argument to be made that it's actually better to partner a lawyer uh, with a family uh, that's going to improve their ability to pursue their care? There are some uh, sites that are making that claim. And then improved patient and provider satisfaction. So we can talk about providers, healthcare <coughs> providers, and I think that the same argument can be made for, uh, for legal uh, providers, is what we hear is much more satisfaction in resolving some of these issues. From healthcare providers, um, you know, I, I joke with people, I get to go around the country and watch, you know, doctors and lawyers fall in love with each other. Um, and it's really true because the, the physicians didn't know that this was a problem. Once they figure out that it's a problem and that lawyers have a solution, they realize that, um, that this is a terrific way to practice medicine and that they are able to focus on the medicine instead of on the intractable problem that was interfering with the medical treatment. And so that improves the provider satisfaction. And that's a very important thing in our country, and I think is a very important thing in a place like West Virginia, where recruitment of health care providers is a real challenge. And so anything that we can do to help uh, health care providers feel good about what they're doing, um, I think is going to be a bonus for any community. And again, this goes to what we call improved clinical workforce skills as well. Improved legal services um, and uh, legal institutions. I, we talked a little bit about improving access to legal services, and we think that Medical Legal Partnership does that. Um, talked a little bit about in the case of Claudia that what we don't have in the legal community that serves low-income uh, individuals and families is a capacity for prevention. That's something that they have in the, in the healthcare world and something that we need to think about in the legal world. How do we help families prevent some of these crises uh, rather than helping them when they're in an emergency situation? So reduction in severe legal needs and improved early detection of legal needs. And then going back to the policy change that we are hoping to see happen in our institutions, communities, and nationally is uh, to improve some of these laws and regulations to hopefully prevent some of these legal issues. 
So now a little bit about MLP. Um, you heard a little bit from Dean McConnell about how it got started. Uh, it took us a while to work out the kinks in uh, pretty much most of the 90s, trying to figure out how can you bring lawyers on site into the healthcare setting to focus on patients, uh, to train healthcare providers, and, uh, and to uh, help um, prevent legal issues. Um, and so uh, it spread uh, gradually in a re very much a grassroots fashion. Um, and now we're in over 230 hospitals and health centers around the country. Um, small programs, large programs. Um, I think you'll find in all, most of the major law schools uh, some inkling towards MLP. I think you'll find in most of the major medical schools some uh, inkling towards uh, MLP. So there's real groundswell. Uh, happening, <laughs> such that in uh, June, July of last year, uh, there was an MLP for Health Act that was introduced in Congress, a bipartisan bill, and it called for a demonstration project, a national demonstration project to be funded uh, by the federal government to prove out some of the pilot data that uh, I've talked about in terms of the impact about uh, cost savings, cost effectiveness, uh, improved medical home, improved health. And so that's uh, um, been a wonderful opportunity to raise visibility about the model and I think some uh, awareness of what the model is capable of. So how does it actually work? Um, programs nationally, they match funds between the legal partner and the medical partner. There's a diversity of revenue streams that are used across the country to try to uh, make this model happen. And uh, some of it really centers around healthcare investment in bringing legal resources on site. And that's what we're starting to see happen. Um, it is a partnership. It's not a referral network. And I think that's a really critical distinction. So we want to have healthcare partners and legal partners at the table together deciding how are we going to fund this? What will our working priorities be? What should our metrics be in terms of measuring success? One of the things you realize between health and legal partners is that we as lawyers define our success very differently than the healthcare partners. We say we won the case, right? That's like our, one of our central metrics of success is that we won the case. On the healthcare side, it's very different the way they think about metrics. And so I think uh, there's going to be a bridging between the two professions through medical legal partnership to say uh, a very important marker of success for um, uh, my legal intervention is that the family's health was improved, right? So how do we as lawyers start to measure that and think about that and incorporate that as part of what we do? And again, those opportunities for prevention that we don't traditionally have in the legal field for vulnerable communities. And so we, we certainly have it in um, uh, middle and upper class communities, access to legal assistance to help you make decisions. Uh, for example, I would never have bought a house without consulting with an attorney first. And that's a really critical role that attorneys play for many individuals and families. And so you need to have that consultation capacity uh, for vulnerable populations and not just waiting until they're in an emergency setting. Uh, the National Center, um, I'm obviously a passionate believer in the model, and so uh, everything that we do is to support the work that's happening in communities like this to help you think about what's possible for your medical legal partnership to bring the right people to the table to um, uh, really cast a very broad net in terms of the stakeholders, to um, think about how do you measure your impact, how do you raise your visibility in your community in terms of embracing this model. Um, I think one of the things that's so exciting about being able to talk to law students that are currently practicing in this model, that's very much how this model has spread. There wasn't some gigantic grant that came out of 
um, a, a major foundation or the federal government that said, you know, start an MLP. It was very much a grassroots movement that happened because law students who uh, worked in an MLP in one law school then went on to be at a legal aid office and they started an MLP there. Um, maybe a resident uh, had heard about it and moved from their residency program to another hospital. Um, and, and that's how the model's really grown is that, that transfer of knowledge that has happened uh, all over, really all over the country. And, uh, and I know that that's what's going to transpire here as the students who are working in the clinical setting and certainly the alumni and the pro bono network uh, that exists here uh, is going to help to foster that. As you can see, we've really enjoyed a tremendous uh, sort of cross-discipline support from a range of different uh, national um, industry organizations and associations in law and medicine. The ABA has been a tremendously important partner. They uh, climbed on board very early on and passed a resolution in support of medical legal partnership that was very meaningful in terms of uh, being able to recruit uh, pro bono support. And that's something that we uh, certainly uh, provide a lot of technical assistance on is helping to in integrate pro bono support into the uh, medical legal partnership models that are uh, happening in, in different uh, communities, whether they're rural, uh, urban, or in between. And finally, I think that's what we're all arching towards, right, is that uh, that's probably not the context in which the cartoon was meant, but I think that for me that is the sine qua non of, uh, of MLP integration which is that um, you are able to access both uh, legal assistance and healthcare assistance in a single setting. So I'm going to stop there, and I would love to hear your questions and take it from there. So. We're going to be taking questions um, for uh, Ms. Lawton, and what I need you to do is come to the microphone here in the middle of the aisle, because that way it will be captured in the webinar. Otherwise, those who are listening to us remotely won't hear your questions. So if you'll please approach the microphone. If you'll raise your hand, I'll get you in order, and then Ms. Lawton will take your questions. Thank you very much. I just want to make a comment that um, this was very valuable. And from personal experience, even though I am a lawyer, when I was uh, just a few years into my law career, my husband needed a transplant. And um, we actually ended up seeing a team of people, including social workers and lawyer, lawyers and accountants, that the hospital provided for us. That Because our first question was, can we even afford this? And it turns out that the law provides um, for free um, transplants, essentially, um, through insurance, through Medicare, I guess it's Medicare. And we had no idea, even though I'm a lawyer. So uh, this is, I just want to commend you on the work you're doing. This is really inspirational, and just, and just thank you. It's certainly, um, whatever that was in its earlier stages 10 years ago was um, definitely helpful for us. Great. Thank you so much for your comment. I also... Um, you know, the program started in pediatrics, and I think it's a really critical place to be, in part because I think pediatricians, I kind of see as the legal aid attorneys of the healthcare profession, if that makes sense, because they think very holistically, and they're really trained in advocacy. And that's not necessarily the case for um, healthcare providers in, in other specialties, but really this is a universal model. And some of the growth that we're seeing right now is going to be happening certainly in geriatrics where legal need is a certainty at a certain age. 
Um, and uh, we have some expansion that we think is going to be happening in the veterans community. Again, um, legal needs uh, may look a little bit different there, but a lot of unifying themes. And so, um, so I think that pediatrics has a lot to teach the rest of the healthcare profession on a lot of issues, but, um, but certainly uh, in, in thinking broadly about these topics and the social determinants. So. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I have a question just about rising medical costs in the legal profession. It seems to me that so much of the increase in medical costs is a kind of preemptive strike against potential malpractice uh, suits. So I'm wondering, in terms of this alliance, how would that, the potential presence of lawyers in a medical setting, serve to discourage the medical community from that kind of massive increase for preemptive legal purposes? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And, and obviously, we, you know, we spent a lot of time thinking, and we have some amazing legal minds in the, commu in, in the legal community and also in the healthcare community thinking about, like, what is the sort of Venn diagram, if you will, between sort of legal need and then health need and sort of how they inform each other. And I, and I think it's a great question. I think that... Uh, you know, stepping back a little, um, what we see happening in the legal community and the healthcare community is bridge, you know, bridging that, m making some of that, um, those relationships and that cross discipline understanding, I think is going to help to, um, to address some of the issues that you're talking about, the sort of defensive medicine. Um, I mean, I think there are lots of other powers. And, and strategies in play that are really important to address uh, some of those issues. But the, the better bridges that we build between the professions so that they understand each other, I think, is all to the better. Um, and, you know, what we see, and there are a number of hospitals where the general counsel has actually, in Seattle Children's Hospital, the general counsel um, and their outside general counsel were the prime initiators of the medical legal partnership model because what they saw, even though they were, you know, they have a certain risk management uh, frame, uh, what they knew is that the questions they were getting all the time were MLP type questions, right? And so, um, so I think, you know, getting back to your point, um, I think that the more um, thorough conversations we can have about what patient needs actually are and how do you actually address them, less medicine, more legal intervention, uh, that's, that's kind of where the demonstration project proposal was heading, is how do, we, how do we understand these are actually like social issues that have legal solutions rather than medical issues that need four more rounds of tests. So I don't know if I answered your question. No, I mean, yeah. Right, and I, and I think, again, you know, this getting to know each other makes a big difference, you know. And so an example of that is, um, you know, the lawyers in the room who work on uh, disability cases, um, understanding the struggle that you have to pull those medical records out of the hospital and getting health care providers who know that their patients are disabled but they don't know how to put it in writing, Simple things like that that could really reduce the, um, you know, the workflow, the tension, and, you know, the, the time and expense. So, yeah. Good afternoon. I wanted to thank you as well for such an interesting presentation. <clears throat> My question um, zooms in. You had a slide entitled Improved Early T Detection of Legal Needs. And that jumped out at me because often, at least there's a realm of legal needs that assume, well, for example, pre-planning and sort mm -hmm. of medical directives, wills, right. those sorts of things where the, the at least legal point of view is 
you can sit down with your lawyer and think through these things while everything is rosy and cheery, but it sounds like in this model you may not see clients or, and or patients until things are at a critical juncture. And so, and, and especially thinking about the underserved, the, the financially, um, under, the financial and social underclasses that this mm -hmm. is particularly directed to, that, that, that those groups would be susceptible to not being able to be seen by a lawyer until they're in extremis. Right. So I was curious as to how the model has developed in terms of addressing precisely that kind of need. No, it's a, it's a great question because, um, because I, th and I think that the power of the model and what you see happening, just like in the law school here, right, you're going to be thinking in the MLP, you're going to be thinking about your legal practice differently if you're practicing in the healthcare setting than if you're waiting at the clinic for people to show up with their legal problems, mm -hmm. right? So the same goes on the healthcare side, which is that, Part of, I think, the power of the, you know, the transformation of the model is to change the training that the residents and medical students and healthcare practitioners get to think about these issues and screen for them mm -hmm. and talk to their attorney um, so that they can do more of the preventive work, right? Because, um, as I was saying, like, it's a certainty that you are going to have legal needs as you age. There's, there's no question about it. And so how do we get the health care providers that are touching those patients to understand what the issues are, understand how to rely on their attorney in a way that doesn't overburden the attorney team, that builds – that's what we talk about, the building capacity, right? So while you're screening about, oh, you know, uh, falls – or depression, or all of the multitude of things that frontline primary care physicians are screening all of us for all the time, they're also screening you for, you know, have you talked with somebody about making plans for if you become in incapacitated? Can I make a referral for you to have that conversation? They have universal checklists for all kinds of topics in the medical world and, you know, as some of the folks who uh, I've spoken with know that I'm a, a, a Tool Gawande fan and if you haven't heard of him, I suggest you check him out. It's something called the checklist, using the checklist. That's what they do in healthcare really well is they do checklists. So we want to get those legal issues on the checklist. But if they're on the checklist and the team hasn't been trained and the team hasn't had models for asking those questions, and the team doesn't have backup with a specialist, to, you know, uh, my medical director says what I really want is, you know, you can show up with a tummy ache. Do I need to send you to the emergency room or do I give you Alka-Seltzer and send you home? Like I need to be able to triage those legal issues, mm -hmm. right? Do you have a, a legal emergency or are you, do you need to, like, take two lawyers and call me in the morning kind of thing. <laughs> so, and I, I'm, you know, <laughs> only being a little flip. Um, I, I don't know if that answers your no, question. No, I think it does. I yeah. see the model is one of intervening as soon as possible, but triaging in order to prioritize and implement a system of needs addressing. And that's the, so, in, yeah. that's the institutional practice transformation, right? Right. Where, I mean, as my colleague likes to say, the healthcare providers, they don't know what they're missing. Right? They've never practiced with access to an attorney. Um, but once they figure it out, they don't want to go back to a time when they couldn't solve the problem of the kid in a wheelchair who, whose mother has to carry him to the school bus because the ramp doesn't work. Right? Those are problems that physicians hear about all the time, and they don't know how to solve. They don't know who to call. And those are things that are, you know, for us as lawyers, like we – can solve those problems. And so, yeah, Thanks. I digress. <laughs> so. um, I just want to echo everyone's thanks. Um, I think this talk has been really fascinating and illuminating about the potentials for collaboration between doctors and lawyers and the role of law schools in that. Um, and 
I, I, we've spoken at length over the, since this morning um, about WVU's new medical legal partnership, um, which, which I am one of the directors of, um, in a, along with Dr. Steve Paul at the Children's Hospital and in the Pediatrics Department. And just to follow up on and what you just said about the importance of lawyers being in the health care setting and how that really changes your perspective as a lawyer. Um, I mean, we had an example of that this year when um, we had, I got a phone call from Dr. Paul who said, you know, I have a doctor in intensive care and he has a, you know, a question for you. And it involved this small baby, a, 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 you know, a few months old who was in, you know, very serious uh, medical situation and it was the child was in foster care and and we went over immediately within two hours of his call, uh, myself and two law students, to um, act as, you know, to provide legal information and to do a consultation, which I think was just a wonderful opportunity for law students to to see the human dimensions, mm -hmm. to work with doctors, and to see how the legal system fits into all of that. Mm -hmm. um, one of the questions, I had actually two questions. Um, one is, uh, one of the things that West Virginia faces is there's a lot of people who live in rural areas mm -hmm. and don't have easy access to come to Morgantown. Um, they do come to the Children's Hospital, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But um, so I was wondering if you could speak to some of the uh, solutions or, or strategies that other MLPs in similarly rural situations have used to address those needs. Yeah, no, thank you, uh, Val. I, I appreciate it, and I appreciate you um, giving some airtime to the great work that's been going on. Uh, here already, and you've, you've laid an amazing foundation uh, and have a terrific medical champion, and that's, you know, half the battle. Um, so uh, what I would say about your question in terms of, of rural issues is that we know that the legal resources are not going to be there for families, particularly in rural settings, because the, just the resources, plain and simple, aren't there. Um, and, but what we do know is that um, not marginally better, actually a lot better are the healthcare resources that are being created and have been created to meet the healthcare needs of the rural population. And that's the network of uh, community health centers in the state, which is an excellent one. Um, and those are the entities that are charged with taking care of some of those um, children and babies that are going back to rural communities from the children's hospital. And so, so that's, that presents an amazing resource to leverage for legal access, uh, for access to, uh, to uh, children and families that need legal resources. And so to the extent that we can um, uh, really meld uh, our legal resources with the health care resources that exist in those communities, I think, is, is going to be really important, and particularly uh, some of the investment that, that is happening around health information technology. Um, we're going to wait a long time before the legal community has the connectivity and technological capacity that the healthcare community has. And so, um, so it behooves us to use that connectivity and, and that infrastructure to, uh, to resolve legal issues. So I, I thank you for that question. I, I do believe that as the awareness grows of the health um, impact of legal intervention that we are going to see more health care investment in lawyers, and I know that that sounds uh, – like crazy talk, actually, <laughs> to think that they would be investing in us uh, because of our expertise. But um, I don't know if that answers your, your no, question. No, thank yeah. you. I mean, then the second question I had was, given you know, th that we're in this era of health care reform, yep. um, what, what role do you see MLPs playing, and specifically um, law students? What can they benefit from mm -hmm. MLPs at this stage of their career? Yeah, no, it's a, I thank you for asking that because I think that um, pretty much wherever you go from law school, whether it's into private practice, um, into the legal aid sector, into the government sector, um, that some facet of the health care system is going to touch your lives, whether it's personal or, or uh, professional. And so I, I think part of our job is to, to really uh, gain a better understanding of, um, of what this is going to mean, particularly in West Virginia, but also nationally, what the opportunities are. 
um, and, and really schooling ourselves in, um, in what some of those resources on, are and how to best align ourselves uh, with um, some of the, those investments and that momentum that's happening. And I, I think um, law students are going to see that um, there, are, there are different facets of, of health care reform that are, are going to touch different parts of their practice and uh, over time. And so gaining that familiarity with the legal institutions and the health care institutions in your community is going to really, I think, behoove you. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you for coming here. I, my name is Matt Delegate. I'm a third-year law student. My question is, uh, and it might just be because I've been practicing for the NPRE, but what are the ethical issues that come up between doctors and lawyers? And uh, I couldn't help but think the whole time, who is your client? Yep. Is it the patient or is it the hospital? That's great. Thank you so much for yeah, grounding me in where the law students are at, right? And, and where I think the lawyers are more comfortable as well. And we certainly spent about a decade thinking about that question. And, um, and it's still evolving. Um, we actually have uh, a textbook coming out um, in June um, that, uh, from uh, Carolina Press uh, that is gonna, has a chapter on ethics. And, and it talks about exactly those issues, right? Who's your client? And how can you run a consultation practice without clients, right? There may be a role for attorneys uh, because we do it um, in a lot of other contexts. Can we extrapolate that context into the medical legal partnership context where you're actually just working, you're working with the healthcare team. You're not actually working directly with the patients, right? You're helping the healthcare team to understand what the legal issues are, to train them, to connect them with the pro bono resources, the legal aid resources, et cetera, right? So, so there's a lot of different ways to skin that cat, I guess, that answer that question. Um, the other question that comes up is HIPAA, for those in the room who know what HIPAA is, which is the uh, health insurance uh, privacy protection uh, rules and how can we share information but do it in a way that protects the patient, protects the institution and uh, everyone who's involved. So those are all things that need to be navigated, but who better than a legal team to help you think about that, to help you analyze that and write the memos that we need to get written so that we can do this kind of practice. You know, I think um, that's, you know, I've been very uh, heartened by the engagement, um, certainly of um, uh, clinic, law school clinical professors nationally to think about this issue and write about it, and they do. Uh, the American Bar Association, uh, we have a terrific uh, pro bono um, uh, resource at McDermott, Will & Emory that is sort of our uh, uh, council that helps us navigate those issues. Um, and so it's, so it's very interesting to uh, answer those issues from a legal perspective and then answer them from the healthcare perspective and think about what are the, uh, what are the challenges, the ethical challenges that we need to navigate? What are the ethical challenges that shouldn't be challenges and that are interfering so much that we actually need to think about changing the rule? because the rule is not helping, it's actually interfering. And that's, kind of, that's what's happening in the network is that we see uh, some of the leaders uh, really wrestling, I think probably some of the hottest sessions at the national conference, which is happening at, in Baltimore at the end of the month, at the end of March, uh, the hottest sessions are the ones where they talk about the ethical issues. Um, so that's, you know, I hope that's helpful. Uh, also, I want to echo my thanks for you coming down. Uh, I'm interested in funding and, and who funds it and where the money is coming from. And is it in your case at BU, is it the medical center that's funding your center? Yep. Or is it a grant? So, so what we strive for, and we're different because we're the national center, and so um, we have some federal investment uh, from Health and Human Services. And, um, and then we have some philanthropy, uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and Kellogg Foundation. So healthcare foundation investment has been really critical um, because we think this is a healthcare intervention. We think that healthcare needs to lead the way in supporting this effort. 
Um, and so, so that's the national center funding stream. Um, but at the local level, what we talk about is, um, I think I had a slide on it, is this is about a match between the healthcare setting and the legal setting. And so there are many different ways that the local sites have funded uh, their, their work, whether it's uh, the law school and the community benefits program at the local hospital. I'm going to be in Illinois next week, and they have, uh, they, I think the legal aid office gets about $250,000 a year from the community benefits program at the hospital that sees the benefit of helping uh, with basic civil legal issues. Some of it is insurance, right? Some of it's third-party payer. Uh, issues from disability payments, but let me be really clear, like what is happening, I think right, what is happening right now is that work that has historically been done in the legal aid community um, to help uh, a homeless person to receive his SSI benefits because he's disabled, that brings a third party payer to uh, a community health center. And that is worth something to that health center, right? And that creates an opportunity for that person to get primary care and hopefully avoid some of those hospitalizations, right? And now they're going to be taking their medicine regularly because they have primary care home, right? And that's really the theory behind it. We've been doing that work in the legal aid community for years without saying to our community partners, uh, health care partners, oh, by the way, I served 100 of your patients last year, and this is what the impact was, right? And so I would challenge the, this is my challenge everywhere I go to the legal community, is to uh, know and track where your clients get their health care so that you can say, I served, you know, 100 of your patients last year, and this was the benefit that they derived, and, you know, let's do this more efficiently <laughs> instead of making the patient come and find us. Let's, you know, put our arms around the patient and, and be more efficient. So, so there are lots of different funding streams. There's a research funding stream that I think is coming uh, very soon. I think there's a lot of pilot data in the network that, for example, you heard the cancer case. You know, those are cases that we see all over the network. And that was the impetus behind the, the federal demonstration project language. Um, I think that what we're prepping for is some major investment in terms of research dollars, that, you know, supporting a research initiative that would give us um, metrics for the health impact and the cost reduction and cost effectiveness of uh, legal intervention. Um, but again, all of that challenges us as lawyers to count our widgets differently and count our metrics differently. And, and that's hard to do because, you know, we're, we like how we do things, too. Um, so does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Yeah. And I think you're right. If you can tell about the hospitals, you know, that I'm bringing you patients, you know, and that you might not have seen before. All right, I'm bringing them to you cheaper. I'm bringing them in through primary care and not through the emergency room, right? Yeah, and so I think for me the, the watchword is creating visibility for the work of the legal aid community, and I mean that broadly, I mean including the law school clinics and pro bono. So our time is up. Thank you very, very much for a wonderful presentation. Thank you all very much for being here and join me in thanking our guest. And once again, I want to thank you, Dr. Clark, for making this possible. And I'd also like to say that these events never take place without a great team. And I want to thank Professor Vidic um, for hosting Alan Lawton, Margaret Obush, who's our events coordinator, Brian Caudill, our director of communications, Louis Mackley, our technical uh, AV person, and Keith Walton, our IT director. And thank you all so much for being here. <laughs>